talk about substantive procedures based on assertion. This is just kind of the appendix. This is opening it up. This is all provided in the ASCPA's authoritative literature, the same literature that you will be seeing on the exam. Just kind of a prelude. If you want to read it, feel free. If not, let's dive right in and see what procedures we're going to do for each assertion. This is for a made up manufacturing company. We're going to see the assertions about the account balances first, and then we'll go to transaction level and then disclosures. And here's the example of what procedures you'd actually do. Talking about existence first, inventories included in the balance sheet physically exist. Well, we're going to do a physical examination of those inventory items. We're going to obtain confirmation of inventories at locations outside the entity. I'm really driving these home, right? I, I know you're seeing these multiple times. However, the ability for you to get these right on the exam is going to be absolutely critical. You're going to see a whole sim with, okay, how do you confirm existence for inventory? And you're going to have possibly 10 to 15 answer choices. It gets ridiculous sometimes. All right, maybe not 15, but even 10 is a lot. 10 from a drop down menu to choose from. You need to be really good at this to understand the connections, right? When are you going to trace? When are you going to vouch? When are you going to use physical examinations? When are you going to use inquiries? When are you going to talk to third parties? Lots of moving parts to keep in mind. Lastly here, inspection of documents relating to inventory transactions between a physical inventory date and the balance sheet date, making sure that you physically purchase the inventory, it didn't just pop up out of nowhere. Let's see here, existence inventories represent items held for sale or use in the normal course of business. Now, here's an interesting one we haven't talked about yet, that inventory is actually inventory, right? You're not listing the equipment as inventory, maybe double counting it. Maybe you've got, <laughs> let's say you're a manufacturing company, you've got a pile of rocks or you've got a forest out and back, and you're going to be like, oh, those are materials that someone could use to build something, right? Well, if you're not actually selling it as inventory, you can't list it as inventory. That was just a total random example I made up. But I mean, that could happen, right? A company could just see a group of uh, resources and say, that's our inventory. But if they have no intention of selling it and that's not part of their normal course of business, that is not allowed to be shut down there. What are we going to do here? We're going to inspect perpetual inventory records, production records, and purchasing records for indications of current activity, understand what they're actually selling. Right? If they have a whole warehouse full of old iPhones and they don't sell iPhones, well, first off, you should figure out what, what's going on. Why do they have a bunch of iPhones in the warehouse? But if they're listing iPhones as inventory and they've never once sold iPhones and it doesn't look like based on anything you've reviewed that the company intends to sell iPhones, then you would again question it. Reconciling items in the inventory listing to a current computer maintained sales catalog. So essentially, you're just going through their inventory system, going through their whole accounting reporting system, making sure that you can reconcile all of the inventory being sold and just checking out the whole system. Inquiry of production and sales personnel. Hey, are you actually selling the products that they list as inventory or have you never heard of what the heck is going on here? Lastly here, using the work of specialists to corroborate the nature of specialized products. That's, let's think uh, hedge funds, very complex uh, financial products. If you're holding a bunch of stock with no intention to sell, obviously there's a lot of complex nuance there where, okay, the health of maturity available for sale and trading securities, maybe you're holding this security for longer, or maybe you're holding it just as a long-term investment, but you classify it as trading, which could be kind of classified more towards inventory, kind of going off a little bit uh, on a tangent here, but also quite relevant and quite important to understand. If there's specialized types of inventory, you want to make sure that that's being properly recorded. And maybe if you change inventory to equipment, right? Maybe you planned on selling, you bought 10 trucks to sell, but then you're like, actually, I want these trucks to include them as equipment and use them as equipment for my company. Well, you got to reclassify that properly. And maybe it's a very specialized machine. That's when you would bring in a specialist. Well, I, again, I'm kind of going on, kind of think of this like a little podcast right now, just talking about as many possible procedures and situations you could see. Because again, as I've said, really the, the best way to be as, as proficient as possible when it comes to the substantive procedures within this exam is just to have seen as many situations as possible. Since you know I can't get you another job somewhere, you're studying, my best opportunity here is just to provide you with as many examples as possible. Next up here, we're talking about rights and obligations. We're concerned about the entity having legal right or similar rights of ownership to the inventories that it actually lists. Well, we are going to examine paid vendors invoices, consignment agreements, and contracts, make sure that that you actually legally have the right to the inventory you have. It doesn't belong to someone else. You're not holding on to it for someone else. You actually purchased it. You also want to obtain confirmation of inventories at locations outside the entity. Like I said, you can have multiple procedures that work for multiple assertions. 
Next up, inventories exclude items billed to customers or owned by others. Instead, you want to make sure it is owned solely by that company. If you build customers and you're just holding on to, on to it for the customer, you should not include that in inventory, right? Maybe the customer can't accept it yet because they're moving their factory. Then you should not count that as inventory. What are you going to do here? You're going to examine paid invoices, consignment agreements, and contracts like above. And you're going to inspect shipping and receiving transactions near year end for recording in the proper Let's talk about completeness here. When we're concerned about completeness, for example, we can be concerned about inventory quantities, including all products, materials, and supplies on hand. What are we going to do here in terms of procedures? Well, we could observe physical inventory accounts. We could analytically compare the relationship of inventory balances to reach recent purchasing, production, and sales activity. That's actually another great analytical procedure is, think about it, your cost of goods sold should be in relation to your decreases in inventory. Your increases in inventory should be related to your inventory purchases. Think about those relationships between the different transactions. Those should correlate. And you could perform analytical procedures there to make sure the account balances are similar over a certain period of time. Next up, inspecting shipping and receiving transactions near year end for recording in the proper period. Next up here, inventory quantities include all products, materials, and supplies owned by the company that are in transit or stored outside locations, similar to what we saw previously that outside locations concept because if you have a large company, you're gonna have multiple facilities, making sure that everything's properly included. So you're gonna obtain confirmation of inventories at locations outside the entity, and you're gonna analytically compare the relationship of inventory balances to recent purchasing, production, and sales. Lastly here, we are concerned that inventory listings are accurately compiled and the totals are properly included in the inventory accounts. What are we gonna do? We are gonna inspect shipping and receiving transactions near year end for recording in the proper period. We could examine the inventory listing for inclusion of test counts recorded during the physical inventory observation. We could conduct a reconciliation of all inventory tags and count sheets used in recording the physical inventory counts using these computer assisted auditing techniques. We could recalculate the inventory listing for accuracy. And lastly, we could reconcile the physical counts to perpetual records. So we physically count 15 pieces of inventory. The records say that they have 14. Uh oh, we see a discrepancy and general ledger balances and investigating significant fluctuations. Let's talk about evaluation and allocation when it comes to our assertions when testing them. What are we gonna do procedure wise? Well, we wanna ensure that inventories are properly stated at cost except when the market is lower. And for any of you who may be saying that sounds familiar, that's the lower cost or market principle when we come to kind of FAR and gap accounting. Now, you don't have to really worry about that particularly. What you do need to worry about is ensuring that any assets and liabilities are properly valued according to what GAAP wants them to be at. And how are you going to do that? And really kind of the, the overall process here, the overall thought process, I mean, I'd say really for other procedures as well, is ensuring that think about the business cycle, the business process, how the transaction should have gone through, right? From production to selling the good to billing, everything in between. And you want to ensure that everything matches, all the documents match up with each other, dollar amounts match up with each other amount of units produced, converted to finished goods, which were then sold to a customer and then billed, right? Making sure it all adds up. So we want to examine paid vendors invoices and compare product prices to standard cost buildups. We're also going to want to analytically compare direct labor rates to production records, making sure that whatever we have on the income statement for direct labor, kind of cost of goods sold expense, adds up to whatever it says we produced. We want to recalculate the computation of standard overhead rates, kind of talking a little bit more about cost accounting there, right? And then examining analyses of purchasing and manufacturing standard cost variances, looking between just really yeah, variances, analytical procedures, all things that would help here. Here's another great point. Slow moving excess defective and obsolete items included in inventories are properly identified. If you've got my classic example is if you are an electronics company, you've got a bunch of iPhone 4s. Now, regardless of when you're watching this video, the iPhone 4 is going to be quite outdated. So if you've got iPhone 4s, you're obviously not going to have that valued at what it originally was. Let's say the iPhone 4 originally cost $1,000 when it was on the market. However, you know, whenever you're watching this video, I can guarantee you an iPhone 4 is not going to cost $1,000. And as such, the company that you're auditing should not be listing it at $1,000. They should list it at whatever written down value it is. Now, reality, maybe it's maybe $25 is going to be pretty cheap at this point. And how are we going to Assess this for the valuation of those possible obsolete inventory items. We're going to examine an analysis of inventory turnover, right? If we don't see inventory being sold, 
that could conclude that the inventory is obsolete. Like if you've got a whole subset of inventory and it's got you know an awful inventory turnover ratio, it means it's not selling. And why is it not selling? Well, there's probably a reason whether that's obsolete inventory, whatever it is, that could lead you to some audit conclusion. We also want to analyze industry experience and trends. Obviously, the industry has changed. Blockbuster is not a thing anymore. Uh, enough said with that. Analytically compare the relationship of inventory balances to anticipated sales volume. All great relationships to understand. Walk through the plant for indications of products not being used. Right? Just get that evidence and just trust your eyes. If you don't see something being utilized, then if you don't see the machines manufacturing a certain product, that product may not be selling. You want to inquire of production and sales personnel concerning possible excess or defective or obsolete inventory items. Simply ask, you know, even if there's fraud in a company, it's probably unlikely that, let's say, a company of 40,000 people, everyone's going to be in on the fraud. That's going to be uh, quite unlikely. And then lastly, logistic and distribution business process. You want to analyze that and assess cycle time, the volume of returns or problems with suppliers. If there's just a lot of issues, a lot of returns, then maybe this is a defective product and you should write down the inventory. Lastly here, inventories are reduced when appropriate to replacement costs or net realizable value. Just essentially, right? If we identify these inventory items as having an issue, we want to write them down. And what are we going to do here? We're going to inspect sales catalogs or industry publications for current market value quotations. We want to recalculate inventory valuation reserves, analyze current production costs, and lastly, examine sales after year end and open purchase order commitments. All wonderful procedures. Make sure you're familiar with these because guess what? You could see a sim such as this. And as of recording this, you know, I may make another sim just based on uh, these p potential procedures, what you could do in each of these instances to assess the valuation and allocation. I think it's that important. So, I mean, I know that's me writing the sim just for our course, but hey, just a little heads up there. We've got here a few more, right? Just a few more, just two more slides here. We've got rights and obligations. How are we going to assess that? Well, what are we worried about here? The pledge or assignment of any inventories is appropriately disclosed. That's a concern because we want to make sure that we have the rights to any inventories we have. Or did we pledge it as collateral in case we didn't pay back a loan? What are you going to do? You're going to obtain confirmation of inventories pledged under loan agreements, attend those board of director meetings and inquiries, ask around. Completeness, the financial statements include all disclosures relating to inventories specified under GAAP, making sure that obviously everything's assessed under presentation and disclosure. And what are we going to do here? We're going to use a disclosure checklist to determine whether the disclosures included in GAP were made. Obviously, you're going to have a big list. GAP is pretty standard. It's got a set of rules. You're going to make sure that GAP says this is what should be included for inventory. You're going to look through the financial statements. If anything's missing, you're going to follow up. What about understandability? Inventories are properly classified in the balance sheet as current assets. Well, that's obviously a big one because inventory is a current asset. How are you going to look into that? Well, you're going to examine drafts of the financial statements for appropriate balance sheet classification. Pretty straightforward there. And then lastly here, disclosures related to inventories are understandable. And lastly, you're going to read disclosures for clarity, making sure that anyone, a reasonable user of the financial statements, can pick them up and understand what's going on. Lastly here, for valuation and accuracy, our concern is the major categories of inventories and their bases of valuation are accurately disclosed in the financial statements concerning disclosure when it comes to our presentation and disclosure. What are we going to do? We're going to examine drafts of the financial statements for appropriate disclosures. And lastly, we're going to reconcile the categories of inventories that are disclosed in the draft financial statements to categories recorded during the physical inventory observation. Let's say it's a simple company. It's got three types of inventory. And let's say in the disclosures to the financial statements, they only list two. Well, you observe three during the inventory count. Obviously, you can see the difference there. That being said, let's wrap it up in a nice summary and send you on your way. Hey there, are you ready to not only pass your CPA exams, but truly understand and enjoy the material while studying? I know it seems impossible, right? Especially to enjoy the material. We'll do it together. Tap into the power of cpa.examprep.ai, where we've got personalized quizzes, multiple choice questions, memorization guides, flashcards, simulations, all tailored to your learning. Our adaptive study planning puts you on the fastest path to success and lifts you back up if you fall behind. Avoid wasting your precious time and money attempting an exam with a low chance of passing because who wants that? We want to get you through this process as quick as possible. Our exam readiness prediction lets you walk in with confidence knowing that you're prepared for success on exam day. 
Thankfully, there's no payment method needed to get started. So why don't you come join us? Visit cpa.examprep.ai and let's achieve your exam success together.